merci. Good evening. I'd like to thank you very much for, uh, for coming out this evening to another uh, lecture here in the uh, Archives and History Library. You know, it's a special occasion if I have a suit on, so uh, we do have a, a couple of special guests with us this evening, an interesting uh, lecture uh, on tap for you. Just to give you a few notes about some upcoming events, uh, some of which you undoubtedly will have an interest in. On uh, May 17th, which is on a Thursday, Dr. Cicero Fain will be presenting Into the Crucible, the Chesapeake and Ohio Railroad and the Black Industrial Worker in Southern West Virginia, 1870 to 1900. So that's keeping right in line with our railroad series. I think that's three that we've had recently. Uh, on June the 5th, which is a Tuesday, our next Tuesday evening workshop uh, lecture will be uh, Larry Rowe, and he'll be talking about the Malden and the salt industry. And then on June 14th, we'll be having Gilbert Casto, who will be talking about uh, the history of the Kanawha Valley, focusing on Fort Lee. So that should be of interest, uh, particularly for you folks from this area. But this evening, we have a couple of uh, special guests and friends of mine from Huntington, West Virginia. <coughs> Jack and Kay Dickinson have been around. If you're interested in history of Southern West Virginia, then you're probably familiar with their names. Uh, Jack has uh, published about a dozen books on the Civil War in West Virginia, and, and he and Kay have been doing research for about 40 years on Southern West Virginia, the people and events that occurred here. And for the past few years, they've been very much involved in tracing the history of the NW Railroad, particularly those two lines that, that run over uh, in western West Virginia, and uh, they have uncovered some really interesting stories, which uh, they've done a lot of the research here in the Archives Library, and uh, we're always thrilled when they, they come up with some uh, uh, article or photograph that they want to point out to, to share with us. Uh, most recently, uh, Jack's probably most noted for his book on uh, General Albert Gallatin Jenkins from over in Cabell County, and, and Kay has served as his research assistant uh, all through the years and is an outstanding researcher in her own right. Uh, but they're here to talk about tonight every bloodstained mile, the building of the Norfolk and Western in West Virginia. And as I said, they've completed four books uh, on this particular topic. Their fifth one will probably be out this fall, and we'll look forward to the publication of that. But I'd like you to welcome. Jack and Kate Dickinson. First thing is, this is a furrin device to me which I haven't used before. So if, if I attempt to drop kick it through the goalposts, you'll understand. But, uh, so bear with me. Uh, to add a couple things to what Joe said, the one reason she and I are so interested in the history of Southern West Virginia is I grew up in Mingo County at the great big town of Kermit. She grew up in Wayne County near the great big town of Dunlow. And uh, we met at Crum High School and graduated together in 1961. So uh, we have had a lifetime interest in that because that's been our home. We've returned there and uh, she has family there. I, I don't have any family left uh, down there in Mingo County. But uh, so we think the whole interest in the N&W and what went on down in that area of the state is uh, perfectly natural to us. I grew up, my father was a history teacher, and I remember he used to talk about bloody Mingo and shake his head. And of course, as a kid, I didn't care what that meant. Well, we've learned what that meant, and uh, I think you'll find it interesting. Uh, let me give you a little bit about the scope of what we've done and the... Uh, the time, the time frame we've worked in and the geographic area we've worked in kind of thing. Uh, basically, the time frame of all our books on the railroad is from the late 1880s when the NW first came into West Virginia and started building up through to connect over into Ohio. And we end them all basically 1958, 1959 because that was the end of steam on the NW. And so basically what we've written about is the, the steam era of uh, 
of the Norfolk and Western Railway. I'll show you in a minute uh, on a map, I think a map's worth a lot more than me yakking about it. I'll show you geographically kind of what we're talking about and some things that happened and that'll lay the groundwork for some more of this. Uh, okay. Here we go. Well, that worked so far. Okay. How did, one question we get all the time, so we, I, I think I'll answer it right now and that may answer 30 questions out of the audience. How did you ever get started on this thing? What started you off on this? And right here is the culprit that started us off on it. Uh, you can probably tell by looking at it, it's a deserted railway station. That, and you can barely make out the word, but this is Dunlow, Dunlow in Wayne County. By the way, this railroad station was built in 1891, so it's a miracle that it's even survived this long. Uh, but uh, she grew up about a mile from this railway station. And I've got a little sign up there in the upper right. You'll see things on these slides that may not mean anything to you. They're to remind me stuff to say. I forgot my notes, so I'm flying this <laughs> just off the slides. So, uh, all along uh, this part of Wayne County are these signs that said Old M and W Railroad Road. And there's an old railroad bed that's used quite a bit up through there, especially when the water comes up and covers Route 52. You may find the only way to get from one to another is drive the old railroad bed. Well, back when she and I were growing up down in that area, there were a lot of the folks at that time that were my age that could remember when the train ran through there and ran through Wayne and Dunlow and Wilsondale, out through Cabway Lingo State Park, through the Dingus Tunnel and places like that. That track was torn up in 1932. So that was one leg of the N and W. The leg that Norfolk Southern runs today is called the Big Sandy Line, so we'll be touching on that too. But that's kind of what got us started. She lived close to this. We thought this was interesting, the old railroad station. We thought we'd maybe write a small article for the children of Wayne County or something about the railroad and that, and that's kind of how we got started. Whoops. I don't know I missed it. Okay. Uh, I said I'd tell you a little bit about the geographic area that we're working in. All right, this thing, let's see if the pointer will work. Aha! Uh -huh. <laughs> the geographic area we work is right from the fold in this map, which is Canova, where the, it's hard to tell, but that's where the Ohio River is, up uh, close to Huntington. We basically deal with Canova to Bluefield. Now, the NMW still runs a little bit, you'll see, over through here, over through Mercer County, uh, before it gets out into Virginia, but we, Generally, we're dealing with uh, from Canova South. Uh, now, this is a 1904 NW map from their annual report, and the big heavy black line with the white dots is the NW. And you'll notice through starting at Canova down through and into Mingo, what's today Mingo County, there's two lines. The first one is the old one. And that's this one that goes through Wayne, Radnor, Dunlow, Wells Branch, Wilsondale. That's where Cabway Lingo State Park is. And there's no county lines, but right past Wilsondale, you cross over into Mingo County. At the time this piece of railroad was built, it was still Logan County. Mingo County wasn't formed until 1895. So this leg right here that goes, and especially to Dingus, which we'll talk more about, beautiful downtown Dingus, crosses back in and comes in at Noggy Tuck down to Williamson, down through there. That was the original N and W line between blue between whoops. I knew it had happened. Pushed the wrong excuse me. Uh, okay. Uh, then so this line that runs like this was called the Ohio extension of the N and W, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. This is called the old line. Its nickname was the Tadpole line. We don't know why, but all the railroaders called it the Tadpole. Uh, and uh, this was built 1892, this leg. Uh, 1902, they constructed this line called the Big Sandy Line. Those of you that have looked at the Green Book, uh, the Big Sandy Line is what's covered in that book. The old Tadpole Line and everything is covered in the Red Book. We, we find it's easier to refer to them by cut. We've had people call us up and say, we got one of your books. And I say, which one? The red, the green, the blue, or the purple? <laughs> and we can figure out who we're talking to right now. Uh, let's see. You'll notice uh, it shows here Crum and the town of Warfield. This is now Kermit. It was once named Warfield. 
So this was renamed about 1909. Here's Williamson, the county seat of Mingo County. I want to show you a couple other things. I had to get close enough to be able to read it. Down close to Bluefield, you'll notice the town of Mayberry. We, if you weren't aware, West Virginia's got its own Mayberry, and boy, it's famous for another reason I'll show you in a few minutes. And right up here is Elkhorn. And Elkhorn's important because by 1885, the NW had made it into Bluefield, and they had a, a leg up as far as Elkhorn. They had just started getting into the real mining in this lower part of West Virginia. They had not got into this coal field here, which is Williamson, Lake Juan, Thacker, Devon, which is the real, as they call it, the heart of the billion dollar coal field. Uh, they didn't get into that until later. So anyway, this is the area we're talking about, and this is kind of the geography that we covered. Uh, we didn't try to do the N and W from Ohio up or from here over to Norfolk, which is, uh, that's really the, at its height, that's the way the N and W ran. It ran from Norfolk to Roanoke to Bluefield, across the river up at Canova to Portsmouth to Columbus and Cincinnati. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and goes down to Place Valley and Wood Lord. This, this eventually went to there and it went down to uh, Winston Salem, I think. There's another leg that comes off up here that I didn't have enough room on the map to show you. There's also a leg that went up the Shenandoah Valley and crossed the eastern panhandle to Hagerstown, Maryland. Uh, one of the wrecks we covered here happened on that leg. Okay, the tadpole is born. Uh, this is the book, The Last Train to Dunlow. And like I said, this is, we started out to write a simple little magazine article, maybe for Golden Seal or something. Then we ran into this guy. If, how many of you have heard of who Jedediah Hotchkiss is? A few of you? Okay, if you're not familiar with Mr. Jedediah Hotchkiss, he, he was known as Stonewall Jackson's map maker. Uh, there's a book written about him called Make Me a Map of the Valley, which is exactly what he did to Stonewall. And for all the great titles during the Civil War of brevet major general, this, that, and the other, breveted for uh, bravery in battle, he had the title I would have liked to have. He was Chief Topographical Engineer, Army of Northern Virginia. And I thought, I would like that title. <laughs> uh, but for, for our purposes, after the war, Jedediah Hotchkiss was a land speculator in West Virginia. When the NW came into the Bluefield area and just started developing that, he and a group of men bought a large area of land down there, speculated with that. The Edwards Banking Company in Philadelphia bought his interests out in that part. He came up here and worked with somebody probably a lot of you have heard a lot about, J.P. Hale, who was the ex-mayor of Charleston, better known for his book, uh, Trans-Allegheny Pioneers. He partnered with J.P. Hale up here bought what's now known as the Camelton Coal Properties, sold it out, made money off of that, and that brings us to just about the mid-1880s when he hears that his friend, Fred Kimball, the president of the NW, is getting ready to run a railroad line up through Wayne and Mingo County like that. He builds another partnership with the Edwards Banking Company in Philadelphia, who, gee, by the way, also backed Fred Kimball and financed the N and W, among other things. Uh, and uh, so Jedediah Hotchkiss uh, forms another land company and buys what's called the Low and Aspinwall Tract, 45,000 acres of Wayne County over into Lincoln County. Now remember, this is 1880s, there is no Mingo County. South into Logan County, 40,000 acres that covered that. He and this group bought to land speculate. He brought through two geologists, one from Ohio and one was that the West Virginia State Geologist, I.C. White, and they went down through there and specked out the coal lands. And he saw, or he thought, he was going to make millions off those coal lands. Uh, about the same time, Fred Kimball decided that what he was doing at that time, his railroad was getting coal out of the southern part of West Virginia, a little bit of southwestern Virginia, and running it to Norfolk. Well, he wanted to expand his market and really do a, a better job and make more money, and he saw the way to do it was to get to the Midwest, to open a Midwest market. And the way he chose to do that was, as I showed you on the map, 
was to build a railroad from his branch of Elkhorn north across the Ohio <laughs> River, which would require building at that time one of the largest, longest railroad bridges in the world that crossed the river at Canova. Once he got to Ohio, he had it made because there was a little railroad over there called the Scioto Valley, and he just bought it, so that solved his Ohio problem. But uh, he had to get from Elkhorn to Canova, and it uh, twerked easy. What he did was he started on both ends. He started a crew at Canova heading south, started another crew at Elkhorn heading north. <laughs> That was, they started construction 1890, and it basically took them four years. Uh, the construction train started out of Canova heading south, and some of the railroaders remarked that at this time in Wayne County, for all practical purposes, there weren't any roads. They were mud, they ran through the creeks, large months of the year, they were totally impassable. You had to have a horse and ride over the mountain to get somewhere. There weren't any roads. So this is the first thing that's going through basically unplowed territory. And here is what it looked like. Doesn't look like much of a railroad, does it? Uh, this is a picture from an album that we purchased that had some old photographs that were actually uh, captioned in it. And all this is is a temporary track down through there so they could get the construction train down and then build. Uh, what it reminded me, did any of you see the, the series of shows that was on the History Channel during the winter called Hell on Wheels? One or two people saw Hell on Wheels. Hell on Wheels was about the building of the Transcontinental Railroad. And what Hell on Wheels was, was their moving, tent, their moving tent city that moved along as they constructed this. And boy, the way they depicted it, it was gritty to say the least. They had, obviously they had a large saloon tent. There's your first requirement. <laughs> they had tents for the prostitutes. They had their own set of tents. African Americans had their own set of tents. The Irish had theirs. By the way, the way the Irish made money was for 25 cents you could get a peek through the curtain of the prostitutes tent. But <laughs> this was a great series of shows. And of course as they got farther west they began encountering Indians, but before they hit the Indians, I told Kay, I said, take the Indians out of this, and this is Wayne and Mingo County, 18 and 90. Because what the NNW did was, first of all, they put ads in Italian newspapers in Italian, recruiting Italian stonemasons. What you need stonemasons for is two things, bridge abutments, tunnel portals. That's what you need stonemasons for. They recruited Hungarians. How they got this connection, I never really understood. The Hungarians, as best we can determine, were dynamiters. This was a high casualty rate job, let me tell you. African Americans, they brought from the Deep South. They did a lot of the hand digging of the railroad cuts. But in 1892, you couldn't just get a steam shovel anywhere, and you saw that. You think you could get a steam shovel down this track to dig? It'd never make it. So all these ethnic groups working along here in these tent cities, every Saturday night there were poker games filled with moonshine, and you dirty rat, you dealt it off the bottom, and bang, bang, the shooting starts. This was a rough section of country, and it was, I won't say lawless, but Boy, it was close. On a scale of 1 to 10, it was about a point five of how much law there was at that time. One of their great achievements was the Dingus Tunnel. I told you about Dingus and kind of showed you where that was. Uh, there's two pictures basically a century apart. Uh, that tunnel was 3,800 feet long. Still exists today over here on the right. The uh, road, one lane, runs through the Dingus Tunnel. And uh, let me tell you, when you've got about halfway in there, and the water is dripping out of the rock onto the top of your car, and you can barely see the other end. She started squirming. <laughs> uh, believe it or not, there is a stoplight at either end so that you don't need a coal truck halfway inside this thing. But it was an engineering achievement. You'll notice the difference over here. See all the rock facing is here? This is the original rock facing, so we know it was done before 1914. And you can't really can't read it. This is 1914 over here, and that was when they bricked 
the two portals of the tunnel, even though it had already been done in stone by the Italian stonemasons. Uh, as long as this railroad existed, and even after the track was taken up, this was a prime spot where outlaws stood on top of that tunnel and jumped onto the train to rob it. A couple of times they had asked these guys, why are you running this train so fast through there? And he said, I ain't going to get robbed again. It went faster, more speed. But uh, it was an engineering achievement, and it's all that exists today, and a one-way road runs through with coal trucks. But at last, uh, they joined the track September 1892. Uh, this sign, by the way, stands at a little place just south of Williamson that wasn't on our map called Rawl, R-A-W-L. That's supposedly where the track joined. But uh, let me assure you, joining the track didn't mean they could run passenger trains from Norfolk to Columbus. For many months after the track was joined, as far as the trains go, heading south from Canova, as far as they could get was Dunlow. The reason was from Dunlow to Williamson, and even past Williamson, a lot of the bridges were still temporary wooden bridges. They didn't have the steel girder, steel plate bridges in place. They couldn't run passenger trains over it. So what happened was that they had a train in the morning that left Canova, went to Dunlow, sat there for four or five hours, turned around and made a trip back. Now, this is, oh, you'll notice the guy in that Coal Land Association, I forgot to admit, that's Jedediah Hotchkiss. So you can just replace that with Jedediah Hotchkiss all over here. That's the company that he formed that owned the land that he was speculating on. But you notice Dunlow has a, pack, a station siding and that's about it. So how do you turn it? There's only two ways you turn a steam engine around. One's on a turntable, which they obviously don't have. The other is turning on the Y. And that's not a letter Y, it's actually a word W-Y-E. And right here, right here, <laughs> right here is what a Y is. So what you would do is you'd come down, bring your passenger cars down, drop them on the siding, back your engine up to the line, back up to this point, jump out, change the switch, pull forward to this part, jump out, change the switch, and now you can back down to here and hook up and you're ready to go forward. It's called turning on the Y. And until they got this line totally open all the way to Bluefield where they had turntables in Williamson and Bluefield, that's what you had to do was turn your train on the Y. But uh, this was a wild area of the country. At that time, Dunlow had a hotel. They had a headquarters of the Dunlow Coal Company, which was one of the coal companies that tried to get started. Only lasted three years, went bankrupt. Uh, but it had uh, an office for the Guyandot Coal Land Association. And at one time, it had 215 people. They took a census to incorporate the town. There were 215 people living in Dunlow in, 18, in 1890 or 1900. Uh, but that's kind of the, a lot more happened, but that's kind of the story of that part of the N and W. And what I'm going to try to do as I go along is talk about sources that we use that you may not be aware of that I think will uh, be exciting if you're interested in some history. And I also want to tell you a couple of interesting, I think, funny stories, and this is one that's funny kind of ha-ha in a macabre sort of way, but uh, it's one of my favorite stories about this part of the territory in this period of time. I'm sure most of you are aware that 19 and 18 was the Spanish influenza epidemic that became a pandemic. It spread to Europe. It killed thousands. It closed movies, theaters, schools, and was was nationwide through all the, they think that's how it got spread to Europe, was through the army camps in late 19 and 18. What most people are not aware of, I certainly wasn't, was in night, November 1903 was a smallpox epidemic along the Ohio River. Now where it originated, uh, no one really knows. It appeared to have started up river like Parkersburg, Point Pleasant, or somewhere in Cane Down River, but I know what you're going to remind me of. <laughs> they found a guy dead in Canova with a letter in his pocket from his friend in St. Louis. His friend in St. Louis had been uh, quarantined in a smallpox hospital in St. Louis, and they actually estimated that the smallpox virus came in on that letter and was passed. And I'm not sure. I'm not a forensic psychologist, but anyway, when this is going on, the, uh, the N&W was basically cut off. 
from a whole bunch of towns because it was afraid they had the smallpox uh, virus in the towns. Also, what they found was there were several men in a camp car in the Canova yard. Camp cars are the bunk cars that they haul the, the railroad workers on. And that all these guys were infected with the smallpox virus. They sent the doctors from Huntington down to examine them, and they agreed. They quarantined the car. Now, how many were in this car? It's a number between four and eight, so it's not 50. It's probably less than 10, but nobody really knows. But there, there are some number, let's say four to eight, of men infected with the smallpox virus in the camp car. When this word gets out, the good people of Canova do one of those, that's fine, but not in our town. You take your train and get out of Dodge, and you take your train to the most remotest, farthest out place you can find. I love where this was. Noggy Tuck. That's where they headed for. I passed this once a day when I was growing up because my dad was teaching on the north and we were living at Kermit, so we'd pass Noggy Tuck every time. So the middle of the night, at midnight, the train silently pulls out of Canova heading down the tadpole line, heading for Noggy Tuck, but it doesn't get there. Somebody in Canova telegraphed the Dingus train station. I should add that what the NW tried to do in this period of time was the, you got to remember, this is no radio, uh, no telephones. So what their aim was was to have a railroad station every five miles that had a telegraph station in it. That's how you got train orders to the trains that said, you got to pull over on the siding, there's another train coming. So. Uh, so this is not much of a surprise that they telegraphed the Dingus station because they knew this train would stop there for water. When it did, the head of the Mingo County Health Department says, stop, pull that onto a siding, and we're going to quarantine it. This was the middle of the night, so he waits till daylight the next morning, and he goes and examines the men in the car and verifies, yes, they have smallpox, puts stakes around it, supposedly with orders that nobody can leave that train. Well... <clears throat> As you can see here, the good people of Dingus had a different idea than take your train somewhere else. They said, let's get two cases of dynamite and blow it up with the people on it. <laughs> There's a unique approach to a deadly virus. <laughs> Fortunately, the NW said, no, no, don't, you know, this is stupid. Uh, we're going to pull out of here. The only unfortunate thing about this story, and we wrote a couple pages on this, we never found where it went. <laughs> We read forward for weeks in every newspaper we could find. It was never mentioned. So where it went and what happened to the men on the train, we have no idea. Uh, there were people in Dingus that caught smallpox and a woman died and her lawyer sued the N&W, took them to court that it was their fault. The N&W had a simple argument. Said, not us. Said, the second the Mingo County Health Department quarantined it and took control, ain't ours anymore, it's theirs. At any rate, they could never prove communication. They could never prove that she met up or was contacted by anybody that was in the train. So, but anyway, I think uh, when uh, Joe said we uncovered some great stories, there's one of them. Okay. Sources. I haven't talked enough about sources yet. Uh, the two major sources we used here that were important was we found Jedediah Hotchkiss's papers, diaries, and maps are in the manuscript division of the Library of Congress. We went to Washington and photographed large parts of that. In his diaries, to show you the influence he had on Fred Kimball and the N &W, in his diaries, he said, sit down today and name the towns on the N &W. He named Dunlow, Fleming, all these other towns. He did, not the N and W. He had some really interesting letters in his stuff, too. He said, we only need one church in each one of these towns. We don't need more than one. <laughs> Where Hotchkiss knew Stonewall Jackson was they went to the same Presbyterian church in Lexington or Staunton. One. So he and Stonewall went to the same Presbyterian church. But anyway, okay. Uh, the, the only other source that I'll mention on that is uh, at this point, to get us started on this, we found that VPI at Virginia Polytechnic at Blacksburg had the NNW archives records and we went there and spent multiple trips and uh, that's where we got a lot of our background material on uh, the NNW and their projects and how they did these things. So that's our major sources on that one. 
Okay. Uh, the second book is The Trail of Palatan Era. Whether Fred Kimball ever actually really said out loud we made a mistake, he may not have said that, but I'll bet you the people around him said it. Here's why. Uh, first of all, when Fred Kimball first conceived this, which was about 18 and 88 before construction started, when they did the survey, he estimated that that Ojai extension to Canova was going to cost $5 million. Smart man, he budgeted $6 million. It cost eight. 1895 was a recession. They had just got through and got the line open. The NW went bankrupt. It filed for bankruptcy and reorged. Fred Kimball came right back as they changed his title from CEO to president to president and CEO or something like that. They changed the but same number of people, same folks. But it it act that eight million. Because he, he had to incur, I think, two or three million in floating debt on that. And to buy the Soda Valley, he had to incur two million in floating debt. And but a, a, a bad depression at that time in the 1890s did it to him, but they recovered. Okay, so Fred Kimball, the other reason he realizes he's made a mistake is you look at the tadpole line, if you look at the detailed maps, they're sharp curves. You have to go slow around sharp curves. There's the Dingus Tunnel. The Dingus Tunnel's not on the flat like it looks. There is a climb up a summit to even get through the Dingus Tunnel. You had to use a helper engine on the back of the train to push it up there. But the real interesting thing is the fact that on the Tadpole Line, when it's a single track railroad, the only way trains pass each other in different direction is you pull one off in the slot. In other words, one off on a side track, right? So another train can go by. Simple enough. Uh, they had a limit on the tadpole line of 25 cars to a train. You think now, you look out when you watch coal train going by and you count them because you're bored. There's more than 200 coal cars on those trains. But because of these short passing sightings, they limited to 25 cars because you've got to pull all the way in, let the other train go by. But like a lot of people, they kind of broke that rule and they bumped it up to 30 or maybe 40 or maybe 50. Well, now the problem you run into is you've got a train longer than the slot. So what happens? You pull all the way in, and I won't use the bad word, but your rear end is hanging out on the main line because you can't get further in. So you put guys out with flares to stop the oncoming train because he, if he's legal with only 25 or 30 cars, you got to pull him all the way up and stop him so now you can pull out behind him and get your rear end, well, you can see on a good day this worked, on a bad day when the guy gets one of his flares or it's a dark night or he's not, they were ripping off the ends of trains at a rapid rate. So Fred Campbell has got to do something about this. So about 18 and 98, he starts a survey to do a replacement line and that was the big sandy line that I showed you that went from Canova, follows the big sandy, the border of West Virginia, down through Fort Gay, uh, down through Crum, Kermit, and like that, and met up with the tadpole line at uh, Nogi Tuck. Uh, and of course, this time, we've got a great tool. We've got a steam shovel. Now, right here's a good place where I'll tell you about one of our sources on this, which worked out great. For a year and a half, when they were building the big sandy line, somebody who kept a nom de plume, a nickname, wrote an article every week to the Cerrito paper that said how things were going. Things happened in camp. Susie and Miss Gladys rode by on their buggy today. We all stopped and waved. Uh, there was another poker game on Saturday night. Two guys were shot, yada, yada, you know, same old stuff. Uh, all the stuff going on in the camp. And of course, the day they brought in the steam shovel was a big day. And they talked about how wonderful it was to get the steam shovel. To the next week when the letter came, it said, well, uh, we turned the steam shovel over in the ditch and it took a day and a half. But everybody kind of enjoyed having a holiday while we were trying to turn it back up. <laughs> but at any rate, there were other problems such as this. But you have to understand on both of these lines, the N and W did not build it all themselves. They subcontracted. They subcontracted to people like this, uh, others that were uh, Millet and Boxley. And for a period of about two or three years in Wayne Mingo County, there were towns named Millet and Boxley, just long enough for them to get through and get the tunnels built. And then those 
uh, those little towns faded and went forever from history. I like the three mules, mules of Long Yorkville. At least they had something. But it, it, it was, this was no easier than the tadpole line, except they had a steam shovel. Well, once again, the guys that, that wrote the letters every week described the mud. One even said, where are the roads? There are no roads in this county. They're all mud holes. Uh, so anyway, uh, but once that line was completed, basically what they did was you ran your loads, your heavy loads, you actually ran north out of the coal field up the big sandy line, and you used the tadpole line simply for returning empties to the coal field, so you didn't have quite the problems with curves, uh, inclines through the Dingus Tunnel and things like that. But nevertheless, uh, there were more and more often there were train wrecks. This happened in uh, a tunnel uh, close to Crumb. It was Christmas Eve. They had extra mail clerks on sorting the mail, and they were all killed inside this tunnel with this train wreck. Uh, there were some great things like this. Outlaw slays the girl he loves. The one thing that we learned that was consistent through all these books that is just fascinating. 1890s and early 1900s, the newspaper headlines were pure sensationalism. They were not trying to report the news. Their job was to sell newspapers. And this is how you sold it. Outlaw Slave's Girl He Loves. Uh, fantastic headlines. A lot of times, in a lot of the, especially wrecks and other shootings, they were way off the mark. They'd say 15 killed in train wreck, and there was one guy killed and a bunch of people wounded, you find out, three days later. So, it, so you take it all with a grain of salt, but they're very funny, and you'll see as we go through this, some are even better than that. Uh, one of the biggest gunfights in U.S. history, of course, is this one, the, uh, known as the Make One Massacre. And uh, on that day, there were more killed. Remember, the OK Corral, there were only six. This is 10 killed in one day in 15 minutes in the town of Make One. So things were happening, and they were making history, to say the least. The other part of this book is the history of this train, the Powhatan era. This was the N&W Sleek Passenger Train. These engines are shrouded. In other words, this is a standard, for you guys that are interested, this is a standard 484 steam engine with a shroud built over it to streamline it. They started building these during World War II, and metal to do this was so in such short supply they couldn't shroud them, so they looked like regular plain steam engines. And after the war, they brought them back in and shrouded them, and they built the rest of them between 1945 and 1950. They built 15 of these engines, rated at 95 miles an hour. One was clocked in Ohio, and a flat stretch is doing 105. These were all, all steel ball bearings, all stainless steel drive shafts. This, in 1950, this was the latest highest technology engine that could be built. Even though there were diesel engines running, this was the fastest and the, and the best built. And they built, the NW built all these engines themselves, by the way. They didn't buy them from Lima or, or Alco. They built these in the Roanoke shops. And uh, there's only one left. It's number 615. 611. 611. So I knew somebody who correct me. It's 611, and it's at the uh, Virginia Museum of Transportation in Roanoke. It was salvaged uh, after a wreck in 1950 and restored and even ran some, uh, some fan runs. Uh, this was strictly a daylight train. There were no sleepers on it. Uh, you had three types of cars. You had your uh, coach, the dining car, and the club car slash smoker car. They used those engines on the Pocahontas, which was another one of the NW trains, and it was a day-night train that had sleepers on it. Uh, but the, the history of this is uh, in this book, too. And then we hit one of these with, okay, great, now what do we do with this? In the midst of writing this book, we make contact with a retired history professor in the Eastern Panhandle. And the reason I contacted him was uh, through my connection of Marshall. I take care of the Rosanna Blank Confederate mm -hmm. Library Marshall. This guy was a donor, and he had donated quite a bit of materials to the Rosanna Blake collection. So I'm in contact with him, and I'm really happy to hear from him when I talk to him on the phone. And he said, well, what kind of projects are you working on? Yada, 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 writing railroad books about the NW Southern West Virginia. He said, really? He said, I've got a photo album that somebody named Herbert Thomas, some engineer on the building of the Ohio Extension. I said, you've got what? <laughs> what did you say? I said, 
Uh, we could be on the road in, oh, say, five minutes. It wasn't quite that way, but two weeks later, we were on the road to go up there and photograph this. Uh, and what's in this book is a collection of pictures made by... This guy right here is Herbert Thomas with his hand on the uh, uh, surveying instrument. They were in the original surveying crew that did the Ojai extension. You'll also notice they're hard to see. Each man is carrying a pistol. There was a reason for that, as you can imagine. Uh, pictures in this book, several of them were cyano prints. Uh, Joe can probably explain better than I the technology, but basic, basically it looks like a blueprint. It's a blue piece of paper, and it was popular for just a short period of time, right around the 18 and 90s. But when you take a cyano print and scan it and invert it and convert it to grayscale, this is what you get. This is an 1891 photograph. That's the quality of it. And this album was full of them. So we photographed every one of them. But we'd already done the book, the red book. So what we, we put in the back of the green book an addendum that had the photo section in it. Like, what else? It's too good to pace up if this is what you're writing. You notice down here, there's even notes that says bridge number 20. We were able to locate where actually some of the pictures were made. They were basically made Mingo County South into McDowell County. This one, I think, is actually a McDowell County bridge. Okay. Uh, have I talked about sources? Okay, she says, I've talked enough about sources. Uh, okay. We've been married almost 50 years. Yeah. We communicate silently. All I need is a look from her, and I know to shut up or change. Anyway, okay, the third book is this one, and you're going to wonder how on earth did you get into this one, which is once again a reasonable question. When all these things were going on in these camps building the N and W, one of the newspapers, they were talking about, believe it or not, there was one between the, the, the Italians and the African Americans, the one camp where several were killed, and the article ended by saying, the law don't go up there anymore, which I thought was interesting. So what you need to understand is every railroad in this period of time had their own police force called the Special Agents, and uh, the N and W was right in there with them. Uh, this is the person that inspired us, even though he was dead before either one of us were born. This was Kay's uncle, Minus Hall. You'll notice he was a Baldwin Phelps detective, a deputy sheriff, and then ended up his special agent. And this bulge in his coat here is not a physical deformity, it's this. Uh, you fellas that are interested in firearms, it's not a 38 special. It's a 32 long Winchester center fire. And we were fortunate enough to find another member of the family that had his guns. Of course, the other one recognizes good old Winchester Thuddy Thuddy. Uh, but uh, Minus Hall, what, I'll tell you more the importance of Baldwin Phelps here in a minute, but he was a NW special agent in the Williamson area from, what, the 1920s and 30s until he died in 1941. But the really great person we met live and went to interview was Mr. Bunn. Mr. Bunn lives in Woodstock, Virginia, and he was a World War II soldier. He joined the NW before World War II and became a special agent, then went off to the war, and he came back and was a special agent up to the 1950s. You'll notice this is him holding this badge that he has here. He not only had his badge, he kept his snub nose hammerless 38, his handcuffs, and he also had his railroad passes that he used. And in the midst of this, his wife said, oh, you might be interested in the scrapbook I have of all of his cases. And he goes, you've got a scrapbook of all of his <laughs> So anyway, we photographed another 150 or 200 things, parts of which we used. But Mr. Bunn was a great source and a wonderful person. You notice, uh, we came out with the book in 2008, and he died the year after that. But he lived long enough to look at the book and say that we had done everything right, and he liked how we had portrayed them, which made us... That, that's what makes you feel good. It's not other things. But he was a great person. Okay. This is a letter from William G. Baldwin. You will recognize that name. Uh, what I want you to see is this is the greatest letterhead you'll find. If you're a historian and you work on companies or whatever, you look for letterheads because they tell you so much. And this one, unfortunately, 
is very difficult to read. What it says over here is special agents, Norfolk Western Railway, Chesapeake and Ohio Railway, uh, Charlotte, Carolina, and Ohio, the Virginian, and the RF&P. The Baldwin Fels Detective Agency supplied under contract special agents to all these railroads, not just the N&W. <coughs> over here you'll notice W.G. Baldwin Roanoke and T.L. Feltz at Bluefield are the general managers. Why this is important is the, the legal way of how special agents were uh, appointed. In 1899, the state of West Virginia passed a law that gave the governor permission to appoint railroad special agents. And the procedure you went through were things like this. Notice he references a letter from the VP and general manager of the Norfolk and Western. Someone, a, an exec from the Norfolk and Western, writes a letter that's saying, we want to hire this guy. He had to have three letters of recommendation. These were usually from county officials, the county sheriff, the uh, deputy clerk, or whatever. And so you, he had to have a package that he sent off, and then the governor would appoint special agents. And uh, I, I can't say enough good things about the archives and what I've used uh, out of their materials. What they have here are the Secretary of State's records, and those Secretary of State's records have all the appointments of the railroad special agents. So we spent, what, Joe, I'd say five or six trips at least before we just got, because it gives you the dates of the appointments and the dates of their cancellations in some cases. Uh, he had a right to appoint them. He had a right to chop them off. Uh, Baldwin Feltz, the reason it's important is as soon as West Virginia passed the law in 1899, the Baldwin Feltz Company did this contract and started supplying special agents. Uh, William G. Baldwin had the title of Chief Special Agent. This is the equivalent of, think of Chief of Police of a mid-sized city. Uh, that was his title. Uh, and he lived, he had his office in Roanoke. That's where all the N and W Railroad special agents were handled out of. What you're used to hearing, if you've heard of Baldwin Feltz, is the other side of the business run by T. L. Feltz out of the Bluefield office, and that was the mine guards. Those are the ones depicted in the movie Mate Uh One thing we set out when we found this out that this is how the system worked, we started, of course, building a. Uh, biographical list of all the special agents we could find. I think we got about 64, does that sound right, in West Virginia. What we tried to see was if any of these wore two hats. That is, were they mine guards part-time and railroad special agents part-time? We only found one, and that was C.E. Lively. I'll leave you to that one if you know who C.E. Lively was. I hear a few chuckles. Uh, but uh, the the Baldwin Fels detectives was a very important part. You, you can't talk about the special agents on the N and W or the C and O without talking about Baldwin Fels. This lasted until about 1935 when the company went under. Fels and Baldwin died within a year of each other, and the uh, the U.S. Congressional Committee was getting ready. They had already called Pinkerton and several others to testify on some things, and rumor was <coughs> they were getting ready to call. Baldwin and Feltz, and they burned all their records. However, Thomas Feltz's papers of his own are at the Eastern Regional Coal Archives in Bluefield, which I'll talk to you more about in a minute. But anyway, wanted to give you the importance of why Baldwin Feltz is in this picture. Uh, like we said, her uncle worked for Baldwin Feltz the time he, at the period of time when he was a special agent for the Norfolk and Western. Uh, a large number of the crimes, as you can imagine, is boxcar theft stealing stuff out of boxcars. It even got so elaborate as you figure out how to stop the train and you get your buddies to come up beside of it. You open the boxcar doors and you load whatever it is out into their wagon or their old truck and you take off with it. Uh, now, how do you get it to stop out in the middle of nowhere where you want it to stop? You angle cock it. If you've watched the train go by, you know the hoses that hang down between the cars and join together are air hoses. That's for the Westinghouse air brake system to function. If that connection is broken, wherever it's broken, from there forward to the engine applies the brakes automatically and stops the train. So this is, this is the crime. Yeah, right around the turn of the century, once again, there were two laws passed. One said it's a felony to interfere with interstate commerce. The second said you can use 
any force you want to stop a fleeing felon. Translates to, if you catch somebody doing that, you can shoot them legally. You can shoot them for a whole bunch of things. They did shoot them for a whole bunch of things. Uh, I'll show you in a minute. They shot back and they killed a lot of the NMW Is special that agents. Pardon? No. No, 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 no. no. Uh, whoops. Uh, Mr. O.M. Dawson on here was the division manager located in Bluefield. And how this worked was Sam Kinsler in Canova. You notice I've got a note down here that says special agent in charge. He answered to William G. Baldwin, of course, as the chief special agent. But the special agent in charge, he was over the NW special agents in Canova and in Williamson and some of them in Bluefield. And this was one of our greatest sources. This came out of one of our greatest sources on this book. We got an email that said, go check eBay and look at this item. I went, what? So I went and looked and it said 50 cases of Sam Z. Kinsler, NNW Special Agent. I thought, yeah, right. Well, I immediately emailed the seller and said, uh, scan me a couple of pages, of, trying to figure out if this guy is legit. And he was, and the papers were. We bought those 50. Two months later, I got another email said, go look now. It was 135 cases of his. We bought those too. So we bought almost 200 of their case files. A lot of it is this. This is how it would work. Is somewhere along the line, you see the crime that happened was first 84. In other words, this is train 84, multiple sections, which means it looks like two trains to you, but they're both parts of train 84. They just run separately. So the first 84 was angle caught by a trespasser, and it delayed two other trains investigate and advise. He, he telegram, telegraphs Kinsler and Canova. Kinsler would then uh, send out the guys from in this case, the Williamson area, to go down to Lindsay and investigate. And uh, so that's how the system worked. Uh, fortunately, uh, to redeem us a little bit on the buying of those cases off of eBay, there were, what, 30 or 40 of minuses cases? No, of minuses. 130 letters. Oh, letters. Okay. With a lot on, him, on her uncle and the cases he worked on, which was a kind of a side benefit. Uh, but like I said, uh, yes, they shot, and, but yes, the guys on the train, the hobos, had guns, and right here's the result of several things. Uh, in 19, I think that's 1914, the hobos actually organized themselves to try to shoot down all the NNW special agents they could find. We only know of one they killed, and that was in Portsmouth, in the Portsmouth Yard. Uh, this is in Wayne County. Uh, John Sutphin, NNW agent, uh, uh, they had a running gun battle at Neal which both were killed. Uh, Van Hoos, this was Mingo County at Breeden, which is right next to Dingus, and another one of the officers shot this guy, and there were a lot of this. Her uncle was shot twice, uh, and he shot a whole bunch of people in return. This was, uh, these, these, everybody packed a Saturday night special. And uh, let me tell you, that's where we got the better take two guns. Some, so an unidentified passenger got off the train in Canova and said, if you're going to Mingo County, you better take two guns. And uh, things like this, I believe it. Uh, the other interesting thing in the papers of Sam Kinster that we bought were arrest reports. And at first glance, it kind of looked boring, but when we realized we had these for seven or eight years, begin looking at things, of course, <coughs> sorry, of course, the WC is lighter colored. Here's the cause of the arrest. I've got too big of fingers. I need to file one of my fingers down. Uh, here's the fine. Here's the sentence. And you'll notice this is Stuart Minus Hall and Lige Burchett, that was Minus Hall's best friend in Williamson, the three special agents that filled out this report. So you look at these and you figure, we've got years worth of this. We can draw some... I'm not a statistician, but we can draw some statistical things out of this that will be meaningful that nobody else has ever done, at least certainly not in West Virginia. So what we did with all of these was we put them into some spreadsheets, and we did some things like this, arrest summary totals. There's the years we had them for, 38 through 44. Uh, now, you learn a lot of interesting things off of this. First of all, you have to understand early 20th century, all the books written about railroad crime said all those robberies are done by black people. Take a close look at, at the totals, and what you'll see is the way they, 
They had other crimes, but I only broke out these four because these were the biggies. You notice drunk, white versus color, trespassing, moonshining. you got to remember moonshining during Prohibition. That was handled by the Prohibition officers more than the railroad police. Theft, other crimes. Every column, like look at this one, white versus color. So this completely blows that theory for West Virginia totally out of the water. The other thing that's interesting, the thing about statistics and tables like this is it tells you what, it doesn't tell you why. And lots of times that leaves some big questions. But let me, sh let me show you, for instance, notice before the war, which you could say down through 1941, drunken arrest was very minor, trespassing was pretty high. Look when the war started, it reversed. I've only had one theory on this, so I can't speak to its uh, truthfulness, but the theory was all these guys, when they came home or they're getting ready to get on the train, they're going to have one more drink the night before they get on that train out of town to the Army came. I, I don't know, but it sounded like a good theory to me. But anyway, this all came out of Kinsler's papers, the uh, arrest summary reports, and uh, so you learn a lot from that. The other kind of side story that we had never even heard of were the bridge and tunnel guards. During World War I and II, the NNW hired a total separate set of people. Usually there were local people that lived close to the tunnels and bridges, as you might imagine. Guys that had been in the Army or they'd been part-time deputy sheriffs or they knew how to handle a gun. And they would put them on the bridges and tunnels. This is the Canova Bridge. During World War I, they did discover two cases of dynamite with the fuse attached under that bridge that had not been set off. So it wasn't all just <coughs> ugly rumors, uh, but they guarded every, every tunnel and every bridge. And in the papers that we had, it gave who, who the men were and where their bridges <coughs> and tunnels were. But it was a completely different set of uh, guys, and they all worked for the NNW special agents. The special agents in Williamson actually employed the bridge and tunnel guards in that area. So we did a big chapter on this because it was totally something we'd never heard of, and I figured most everybody had not heard of this part of it. They did have guns, but they didn't own them. The NNW handed them out the gun when their shift started. They turned the gun back in at the end of the shift. So, kind of an interesting sideline. The other person we met along the way by email and by phone is, and before you poo-poo a woman with a PhD knowing something about NNW special agents, take a look at the bottom two lines of her qualification. Captain Conrail Police Department and Metro North Commu Commuter Railroad Police Department retired. This is the recognized United States and North American authority on railroad police, I found out. I, I found a couple of her articles on the internet that were really good, and it referenced some of her other articles that I couldn't find. So I finally found that she was at the John Jay College of Criminal Justice and said, hey, I'd love to get a couple copies of your articles. She said, great. We started talking back and forth. and. Uh, she said, what are you working on? I told her, and she said, I'm really interested in that. So we had some good conversations. And as we got near the end of the book, I said, I know this is crazy for me to ask anything like this, but if I sent you this manuscript, would you just read it and tell us where we're going wrong and what we can do? Are we doing anything right or bad? Or would you see something changed or anything? She said, I'd love to. So we sent her the manuscript minus the pictures. And what we got back was a whole page endorsement that we used and had published, and this is only the little one little paragraph out of the bottom of the endorsement. So it's kind of speechless. What do you say to something like that? So uh, she, what I said was, you'll get a complimentary copy. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Doc Schultz, as we called her, uh, by the way, she not only teaches at John Jay College of Criminal Justice, at the time we were doing the book, she was under contract with two railroads in Arizona and the Mexican National Railroad to organize their entire railroad police force. So she made other money other than teaching college at John Jay College of Criminal Justice. But once again, another one of those great people we met along the line. Okay, i got to get a drink of water here and think about uh, Chancellor's papers. Any other sources that well, we went back. We went back to VPI at Blacksburg and went back through their records because they had some 
they had some reports of uh, the crimes, but uh, the fact that uh, Bolden Phelps burned all their records was the worst thing, but we did find Kinsler's records that we were able to do things with. Okay, this is my favorite. This is the wreck book, as I call it. Uh, and the little thing there from the wreck of the old 97, most of you have heard, uh, this is absolutely true. Uh, generally speaking, the crews of steam engines in wrecks were not killed by trauma of the wreck. The, when the boiler burst or the steam pipes burst in the cab, it scalded them to death by the steam. Uh, you'll notice up here in the corner, this is kind of to remind me, this is a wreck that took place up in the eastern panhandle. I told you that's really the only thing we did about the N and W in the eastern panhandle outside of southern West Virginia. These two met head on, which makes it a true cornfield meet. You've probably never heard that term. The first head on train collision in the United States, well before the Civil War, occurred in a cornfield. And it got the nickname of a cornfield meet. And so from then on, every railroad collision was called a cornfield meet. So, uh, okay, once again, how did we get into this? Uh, here's how we got into this. You notice this is Chattaroomingo County. What you don't know is that's four days after my 13th birthday. You all can do the math on your own. Ain't going to help you. Uh, four days after my 13th birthday, and my dad had an in with the state police. Uh, he helped develop the driver's highway safety program, and he taught defensive driving to the state police. And so the phone would ring lots of times at night and tell us things that would show up in the paper two days later or whatever. Uh, but they called and told us about this wreck, and he drove, uh, he and I drove up there to see this. Now, your, this view is from the Williamson side looking south. We came up from the other side, and we're looking at the bottom end of this train. And let me tell you, it's kind of something you just stand there and are real quiet looking at this thing, because it's humongous, and it's still hissing steam. <laughs> so, something more than a half century later, and I certainly haven't forgot about it. So I think these are interesting, and uh, once again, look at some of the great sensational headlines. I like the harvest of death reaped yesterday. I think that's a dandy. <laughs> Notice that one happened at beautiful downtown Dingus. Uh, lots of times there was multiple wrecks in the same day. This day was one of those award winners, five wrecks in a day. Uh, the bottom one is interesting. This is as late as 1950. Uh, the water was high, and when this locomotive went over, it did go in Tug River, and they had to jump for it. Uh, so there's some fantastic stories in here. But before I get to here, I don't want to forget to talk about the survivors. Once again, as a sideline of just, instead of talking about wrecks and how many were killed and blah, blah, we begin to find some survivor stories that were just as amazing as some of the others. And our favorite survivor story was told to us by one of the family members, and then I went back and tried to verify as much as I could of his story. His ancestor was a man named Alfred Cleveland. Alfred Cleveland was a conductor on the NNW before 1900, this happened. Now, at late 1890s, probably 1898, 1899, Alfred Cleveland had a white female bulldog he took with him all the time. You gotta remember, this day's esteem, the conductor lived in the caboose, basically. He, he had, did his paperwork and everything in the caboose, and so Alfred Cleveland kept his white bulldog in the caboose, and his bitch in the ditch, one mile west of Dingus Switch. Oh. <laughs> I, I thought that was really touching. <laughs> There's some other survivor stories in there that are even more bizarre and fantastic as that, so even if you're not interested in all the wrecks, you can read the survivor stories and you'll really find some interesting things. Photographs, we were able to find a bunch. You notice this one came right here from the West Virginia State Archives. This is Hemphill, McDowell County, September 1936. And the boy admitted a costly thriller wrecking an NW. You know how he wrecked that? Put a spike across the rail, that's all it took. And you know what his defense was? All the boys are doing it. They sent him to the reform school for five years till he turned 18. Uh, I should have added, uh, back when we were talking about the NW special agents, this was one of their other missions, not just to solve robberies. They had to investigate every train collision of derailment where that was anything major to see if it was vandalism or if it was purposeful on somebody's part. So they had to investigate all these wrecks. Uh, 
The big boy turned over there is a 2882 Y5, which is a huge engine. I think it killed one of the crew members. But by far the most famous wreck, this is the most famous West Virginia wreck. There was a CNO wreck on New River that was famous. This greatly, greatly out eclipsed it. This was a, the newspaper receives July 1, 1937. The wreck occurred the day before, which would have been June 30. This is in Mayberry, that little town down there I showed you just north of Bluefield. Uh, our oldest son is an artist, and I asked him to do an artist's conception of what this was like. Uh, that trestle is about 100 feet high, and as you can see up here, uh, four killed, a uh, four at home escaped. How the four at home escaped was when it hit, there were two explosions. The first one, when the engine hit the ground, and I'll show you why in a minute. Ten seconds later, the bolt blows off of this, and the whole town thought it was literally the end of the world, and the way the people escaped was the man was in the house, his children were playing out back, he had time to run out, grab one in each arm <coughs> and his wife, and say, run, and it splintered their house. And uh, there's the engine. Once again, fellas that are interested, it's a 2882 Y5. Uh, you'll notice it weighs 582,000 pounds. I'm sorry, 582,900, depending on how much coal you got in your coal tender. That's why that thing made the explosion it did when it hit. Technically, this wreck was a uh, runaway because what it did is there was a slight uh, downward incline out onto the Mayberry trestle and they lost control of it. The, uh, the types of wrecks that we covered in this book that we found that in general the experts that write about train wrecks the three types you talk about are collisions, cornfield meets, where one train hits part of another or another, derailments, where they may not have hit anything, they just derail, like the kid that put the spike on the rail and derailed that one, and boiler explosions. And this is kind of a subset of that because it was a runaway, technically turned into a derailment. Uh, the other interesting thing is we were talking about a couple of you before the meeting, uh, what do people do the next day? They get on top of the blown out boiler and have their picture made. Uh, right here's the, uh, this is one of our sources I want to talk about. Uh, where I say over here, the ERCA, this is the Eastern Regional Coal Archives. How many of you are familiar, I saw somebody nod, yeah, a couple of you know what the ERCA is. The Eastern Regional Coal Archives is in Bluefield, it's on the second floor of the public library. And they have a fantastic collection of not just coal mining and coal mine related, they have a lot of, we went there for the photographs of the wrecks that they had, and we found this panoramic view. This is only a piece, this and this, are only two pieces of a panoramic view about five feet wide that had never been unrolled since 1937 and never been published. Okay, uh, as you can imagine, one crane don't pull these guys out of the ditch. It takes several. And, no, not, okay, no, here we are. Okay, here's another side story. We got in on this one that turned out to be great, and my wife pursued this. We found out how wreck crews operated in, in railroad yards. I worked in CNO's 16th Street Yard office in the 1960s when I was in college, and I worked for there were three notches above me, but I worked under a yard master. You have a yard master, you have a train master in charge of movement of trains, and you have a wreck master. These guys, the wreck master, once a wreck occurred and the wreck master arrives on site, he is in command. It don't matter who else is there, a vice president of something, he is in command. And how I envision this, after you read about wreck masters, is Edward G. Robinson with a little cigar saying, you bottom dwelling low lives, get your backs into it. <laughs> Surprisingly enough, his job is not necessarily to clear the wreckage. Get to track open. Pardon? Get the track open. You got it. Get the track open. In the early days of the very early days of the 20th century, box cars and coal cars were made out of wood. And generally what they did is they didn't even try to salvage them. The wreck master would just say, pull them over in a pile, light a match to them, that's done, next. But, uh, as you can imagine, there's a lot of places in southern West Virginia that have got problems with clearing track. The other uh, tool that he had in his toolkit was he could build a flyby. A flyby is a 
temporary piece of track that goes around the wreckage so you can open the line. Because remember, that's his, that's his number one priority on his job description. And so you could build a flyby or a sawby, it was called. Well, there's a lot of places in West Virginia you can't build a flyby or a sawby. As I describe it, the geography looks like this. These are mountains, and down in here is the railroad, the highway, and the river. Uh, but anyway, these guys were a whole other breed. And uh, my wife did a lot of research and was able to locate uh, several of who these people were and wrote an entire chapter on wreck masters and their crew. We also did a chapter on wreck recovery equipment, the types of cranes and other material and how they work this. And it's a fantastic story. Our, once again, one of our fantastic pieces of uh, uh, source material was this. We found out while we were at Eastern Regional Coal Archives looking at photographs that he had this ledger called a train accident ledger, and we thought, ah, this isn't going to be worth anything. Well, he brought it out, and it's about three feet square. And when we opened it up and looked at what's in it, it doesn't take long to figure out the, va the value of what's in here. This is August 1910, the Scioto Division. Scioto Division ran from Williamson up to Portsmouth. So there are were Ohio wrecks in here. Uh, the name of the station, you'll see the first one here is Kermit. You've got the engineer's name, the conductors, number of the train, which there's a lot of X's, that means extra. You've got XE for extra east, XW for extra west, and all that. But you have the engine number, that's helpful. See how many times this engine's been in an accident. But here's the great part. This is the dollar amount of damages to engines, cars, and tracks. When I saw that, I said, oh, we can do some statistics with this that's meaningful. Uh, over here is the cause, and I know these are hard to read. This is a collision, engine failure, derailment, and action taken. Frequently, you can't, you can't read this from where you are. This guy got a 30-day suspension. The section foreman, people would get third, uh, 10, 30, and 60-day suspensions if they screwed up. So what we did, you'll notice this is page 337. This was a 375-page book. We photographed every page. I keyed it into one Excel spreadsheet so I could do things like this. Once again, cracks a piece of history that, uh, uh, that kind of went against some of the other uh, stuff that had been written. Uh, and what I did was I took, this is something happened to the train itself. Uh, the brakes failed, a wheel fell off, an axle broke, uh, any one of a number of things. This is railer track, track spreading, and this is a defective switch, just plain goes bad. This is crew errors, emergency air braking, a side swipe in NMW's technology in their discussion in this record book, a side swipe almost always got somebody either fired or a 30-day suspension. Side swipes were continued absolute, considered absolute crew errors. But once again, a lot of books that have been written about Western train wrecks said it's all because of the crew. They're drunk, they go to sleep, switch, they ignore the orders, they ignore red, red board. Red board means it's all red lights for you to stop, and that they ignored the red boards. And you look at this, and you add these three together, and by far, in this period of time, 1907 to 1917, which was covered in this ledger, it's defective equipment beyond the shadow of a doubt. So now once again, either West Virginia is different, the NNW is different, or something, but I thought that was important. Did I cover enough sources? Okay. <laughs> yeah, uh, the person who ran the Eastern Regional Coal Archives was Dr. Stuart McGee, who was a professor emeritus of history, retired from West Virginia State, and he passed away a couple of years after uh, we did a lot of our work there, and he's uh, sorely missed by a lot of us. Okay, book five, you'll notice it's still under construction. Uh, we're just about finished. We're through with the research. We're through with the writing. We're down to doing captions on photos, and we haven't done an index yet, but basically it's, it's finished. Uh, you notice some of the stories we had about some of the fantastic shootings and laying the girl on the track and all this kind of thing. Uh, so once again, the working title of this is going to be Murder Along the Tracks. And if you talk about murder along the tracks, how can you do it without mentioning this last name? Now this is Cap 
Atfield. This is Devil Lance's son. His legal name is William, William Anderson Hatfield Jr. Everybody called him Cap. Uh, his greatest claim to fame, they said, was he killed more people during the Hatfield-McCoy feud than anybody else. And what that number is is somewhere between 8 and 18. So pick a number. Uh, the young man with him here is Joe Glenn, his stepson. He called him my boy and my son, but it, he was really a stepson. And all of this here is sensational headlines. You notice that's a Boston paper. So they're trying to sell, uh, especially like McCoy clan aiding legal forces. Randall, had, Randall McCoy did ride in to help catch him. And he's the one that coined the phrase, I want to catch that six foot of devil and 180 pounds of hell. I like that. <laughs> How would you like to be known? Six feet of devil and 180 pounds of hell. Uh, what happened was uh, 1896, which would, was the first general election that was held in Mingo County when Mingo County was formed as a new county. 1896 was the first election. These two fellows rode into the town of Maitland on their horses, armed with various reports. One or two of them had Winchester rifles. Either one or both had Colt revolvers. They, they had guns, as did most of the guys in town on election day. Because you didn't just vote. What did you do? You started talking about it and you started drinking. And that's the way they did elections in the 18 and 90s. And before the day is over, two Rutherford brothers, let's say they had a confrontation in which Cap Hatfield kills them both on sight. A third man that was a friend of theirs, the last name of Chambers, comes running out of the building and Joe Glenn shoots him once right between the eyes from 15 feet away. Joe was a pretty fair shot, evidently. They escape into the woods and that's when all this happens. Uh, they catch them, uh, they try them, they find them guilty of, wasn't first or second degree murder, I think it was manslaughter. Uh, they sentence Cap to serve his time in the Mingo County Jail. Joe Glenn at that time was only 14 or 15, so they sent him to the reform school until he became 18. But the story's not over yet, as they say. Cap Hatfield, living in the Mingo County Jail, didn't have it as rough as some. Every weekend, they opened the doors to the jail cells. They let his family come in and bring picnic lunches, and everybody had a pretty enjoyable time. So after one of those, when they went the next morning, Cap wasn't there anymore, and there was a big hole chopped at the wall. So <laughs> off goes off goes the posse again. This time, however, they're chasing down the very southern part of Mingo County, and he holds up in a rock cliff on top called the Devil's Backbone. And this is one of those, if you ever study military strategy, you want to be on the high ground, this is on the top of a mountain made like this in a heavy rock cliff, and the posse has to come up it. And one guy with enough ammo can just pick them off, and that's what he did. Now, first rumor was there was a lot of people with him. Nobody knows, nobody saw him. They did kill multiple posse members. Uh, somewhere along this point, Randall McCoy did come into town and say, I want to join, and I want to hunt down that, that guy. Uh, Mountain Fortress blown up. One of the Baldwins from Baldwin detectives watched it through his field glasses and said, I can name this tune. Fred, back into Williamson and get me two cases of dynamite. So we sent guys up the hill to plant the dynamite. The first two uh, didn't get very far. Uh, whoever was on the rock cliff shot and killed them dead in their tracks. So at night, they planted the dynamite. They blew it up. They thought, sure, they had him. They charged forward. He shot two or three more, or whoever was in the rocks shot two or three more. They retreated. They tried it again. The second time, it was deadly quiet. It had blown the devil's backbone totally off the mountain into the creek. So they went to the rock cliff very carefully, and Cap wasn't there. So he turns up, he and Joe, as a matter of fact, turn up in Logan County two or three years later and both become lawyers. <laughs> so whether you're interested in all the shootings and killings, there's some great stories here. Uh, we divided this book right down the middle. She wrote all the Wayne County, I wrote all the Mingo County, and this is one of her stories. The Vincents, uh, you'll notice over here in the little message to the side, 100 gallons of whiskey was confiscated during this raid. Uh, Two people were killed in this, William Vinson, the head of the Vinson clan. This was the gun he had. Uh, a member of the family located us, and we were able to photograph some of this. Fellas, you'll notice the hammer's been sawed off, the sight's been cut off and removed, and we all know why. You're right. 
comes out of that coat pocket without catching on any button. So uh, th this is one of the great stories here is the Vincent, whole Vincent family organized against these sheriff and deputies. Great story. Uh, once again, headlines are just fantastic. These are some of our favorites. Hers is on top. Without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission of sin. And I won't read the rest to you. Uh, you can read that yourself. <clears throat> so that's a real dandy. Uh, the bottom one is one of mine from Mingo County. Her aim was best. And another newspaper article said, now it's my turn. I love this one. Mr. William A. Dare, uh, who lived in Mingo County, was, he did what a lot of people did. He was a broker, a, a timber broker. He didn't cut the timber. He didn't saw it. He, broke, he bought it at the sawmill, and then he made trips to Cincinnati and Columbus to broker it and sell it on up the line. So he was gone from home frequently. This time he was gone. Uh, he came back a day early. It's called, ah, oh, yes. Came back a day early. And what was standing outside their house in the road is his wife holding hands with a man who he doesn't recognize. A few words ensue. He pulls his revolver and fires five times at his wife and missed every one of them. <laughs> now, another newspaper report said she never spoke a word and she stood stock still while he was shooting and he missed her every time. So it said she walked in the house, took the Winchester from above the door, and walked outside and cocked it and said, now it's my turn. <laughs> William realized he had probably made a grave error in judgment. He turned, he ran for the woods, and she shot him one time through the back and dropped him dead. It was real self-defense. Uh, some of the others, I, I'm going to speed up and get done with it because I'm way over time. Uh, there was a lot of of killings inside the train, uh, mainly by hobos riding in the cars. There were a few on the passenger trains. There's a lot of that. This one is great because this Cerrito man, he fought with Custer, uh, not at the little bighorn. He was one left behind in the fort, but he was in the 7th Cavalry. And he said first time he'd ever drawn his gun on a white man, and he was too old to start, but he killed this guy anyway. Uh, <laughs> This, uh, you may have heard about some of this that went on in World War I. These were deserters and slackers who banded together over at Dingus and Lake Wanda. They had several shootouts. Uh, okay. Uh, this book will be available about September. And uh, I have a notepad. If any of you would be interested in getting a flyer when that book's done, just to give me your email address or snail mail address and we'll mail you a flyer. Uh, if you have any questions, we'll take them now. Uh, I invite you, several of you already looked at our book, come up and look at our books, uh, take some flyers on the books. We're ready to sign or autograph any of these if anyone would like to purchase one. Questions? Do you know how I wear you guys tonight? Yeah. Uh, it's, it's called Barry, Bill Barry. You that's it. That's yeah. Right. Yeah, I, re I remember reading that. But Mayberry's claim to fame has always been the, the Mayberry Rift. Other questions? I was going to ask, eventually, what did the state police have as far as jurisdiction on the railroad? Well, the, part of the problem is, don't forget, a large part of this happened before 1919, and that's when the state police was formed. So okay. after 1919, now during the mine wars, which is 1920 and 1921, they weren't organized well enough yet, and several of them were killed during the mine wars, and we've got we've covered that in our book about uh, the, uh, the state policemen that were killed. So once you get past 1920-1921, they've got a, a good record and uh, a good hold. But they had just formed in 1919 when the mine wars started. My grandfather was an engineer. My grandfather was an engineer on the NW. Super. And I'd like to know, where do I start to find what might be records would actually have something about him in the NW? First thing I would do is email or call uh, the Newman Library at VPI, Virginia Polytechnic of Blacksburg. Let me caution you, at the time we did our research there, all the NMW archives was at VPI. Since then, they've told us a lot of that has been removed and Norfolk Southern has taken it to Atlanta. So before I'd make a trip there, I'd get in contact with them, find out what they've got. If you go online to VPI's image-based website, they still have all the digital photographs they made of the original pictures, and I think it's like 12,000 
for the N and W. It's a fantastic number. And a lot of the pictures we used, we bought from them the right to be able to publish those. I'd contact them first. I am an engineer from Northern Southern. I have my life in Outstanding. I thought you looked familiar. We're, you were at a meeting somewhere where I was because I remember what you looked like. <laughs> okay, others. Well, thank you all for coming. Come up and <laughs> Good God. Hey, who are you? Hey, who are you?